Good morning and welcome to this first episode of this new series related to the turn-based tactic project. In this series, we're going to go through all the features that are in the project and I'm going to give you more information about them. That way you can use this project as a base for your own game, as a template, and then you'll be able to, let's say, add more units, add more spells, and do anything you want. And in today's video, as a first step, we're going to go through the whole game. We're not going to take a look at the content of the project at all, we're just going to focus on all the mechanics that are currently in the game. Game. I'm going to show you all the different game modes and all the buttons and explain to you how they work and what you can do with them. And in the case that you prefer having a text version instead of a video version of all those explanations, I'm going to link the PDF of the project documentation in the description. So let's get to it. So when you open the project and you press play, you start in the main menu of the game and this is my main menu. I decided to add a bunch of example map in there. And the first example map we have is the debug map at the top right here. This map contains all the debug information you need to be able to test all the different functionalities of the game independently of if you are in a combat or not so dependently of the scenario of the game you can just test everything and that's pretty nice then under that I have the combat maps these one you just start in a combat as soon as the level is loaded it's going to launch a combat you can play the combat until the end or surrender whenever you want and then once it's done you're just going to be brought back to the main menu Finally, I have the overworld levels right here at the bottom. For these ones, you're just going to spawn in an overworld and then you'll be able to control all the different units on the level and then you'll be able to trigger the combats yourself so you can decide which units are going to attack which enemies and then you can really decide which combat you want to trigger yourself. And that's pretty much it. In today's video, we're going to go through pretty much everything and I'm going to explain them to you and show you how they work. And we're going to start with the simplest levels, which are the combat combat level that we have right here. So let's start by, let's say, Fair Jewel. Why not? And here we are in our first combat level. So on the left, we have our units right here, and they are going to fight against the units on the right. The units on the right have the little robot head icon above their heads, which means that they are going to be controlled by an AI. We are controlling the left side, and the right side is going to be controlled by the computer. Now we can see that my camera isn't really focused on the action, but that's not an issue because we can move it using WASD on the keyboard so I can move my camera around I can use my scroll wheel on my mouse to zoom in and zoom out if I want to I'm just going to zoom in a little bit more and we can also rotate around the action using the letters Q and E on the keyboard so you can rotate around the action if you want to in my case let's say for this combat I'm just going to be somewhere like here and now we're going to take a look at the interface a little bit. So right here in the top right corner, we have the portrait of the main unit, the one that is currently playing. So the one that we have right here, it's also going to be replaced if we are overing another unit. So we can display all the statistics of all the units on the grid if we want to. Uh, for those statistics, we have the health point, obviously, and then we have the action point and the movement point. These points are going to be consumed depending on the action we are executing. And once we're done spending all those points, we can end our turn and then they are going to be refilled for the next turn. So here I have my main unit, the warrior, the one that is currently playing, and under him I have all the other units. I have the priest in my team, the ranger in my team, and then the opposing team. I have all those units right here, and they are displayed in the order of their turn. So the first unit to play is the warrior, then it's going to be the priest, the ranger, and then the other warrior, the priest, and the ranger. So if I end my turn, which is the button that I have right here in the bottom right corner that you don't see, but it's just a simple button written and turn on it and if I click on that button it's going to go to the next unit I'm not going to do it right away because I want to show you the spells and everything but we're going to use it a little bit later so for the spell we have them at the bottom of the screen right here in the middle uh, so for my wire I have two spells I have this one right here which is the sword slash so if I over the button a little bit we can display all the statistics of the spell so how much action point it costs in this case it's three action point and it's going to inflict four to six damage and then for the other spell here it is I have all the stats of my other spell spells and finally we have one last corner to look at before we start fighting and it is the bottom left corner right here we have the end combat button which lets us end the combat if we are bored and we want to end the combat right away and then we have a few options we have the tactical mode which hides the environment and only displays the tactical grid which is a pretty nice feature in my opinion in the case that you have a pretty complex environment in my case my environment is super simple so it doesn't really matter but uh, if you have a lot of assets 
assets and you just want to focus on the combat, I think that's a pretty interesting view to hide all the noise that you don't really need to see. So here it is, we have the tactical mode and then we have the time 1 and time 3 options at the bottom. They are just going to affect the speed of the game, so if you think that the animations are playing way too slow and you want to speed them up a little bit, you can just click on times 3 and it's going to play faster, otherwise the time 1 is going to be good enough for us. And now it's time to fight a little bit. So the unit that is currently playing is my warrior right here and we can move him in the movement range that we can see right here. So the warrior has three movement points so we can move three tiles. So let's say move him right here. I still have one movement point that I can use but I can cast my spell first if I want to. So I have two spells. They don't have that big of a range. So I cannot really target anybody just yet but I can still cast them in the empty space to show you how it looks. Here we go. I'm casting two spells and I'm just going to run away because why not I cannot attack anybody so it doesn't matter I'm going to end my turn it's going to be the turn of my priest which I have right here the priest can move around he can cast maybe the first spell that is an AoE spell so it's going to attack the warrior that's not good but we can heal him right after so that's pretty all right I'm going to move out of the way just like that also and for the ranger that one is probably going to be able to reach the enemy so I'm just going to move right here select one of my spells let's say this one because I can attack the enemy with it so here we go attack attack and then I'm just going to run away I'm going to end my turn now it's going to be the turn of the enemy team and they are going to play their turn they are controlled by an AI so the AI is going to play two 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 the ranger is selecting his best attack and that's going to be on my ranger here we go now the ranger played and it's my turn I'm going to move my warrior here and I think I can attack the enemy yes I can as you can see I didn't click on the spell to be able to select the spell I just use the, the numbers on my keyboard so I have the number one to select the first spell and the number two is going to select the second spell so one two one two so I can select my spell super quickly and attack the enemies super fast here we go now it's a turn of my priest I'm going to move right here and heal my other units uh, because they were damaged here we go move it out of the way and now it's the turn of my ranger which I can use one of my spell and then move a little bit closer to use my other spell and now I can run away super far here we go and now it's the turn of the enemy but since we have other things to see I'm not going to end this combat I'm just going to click the end combat button and go back to the main menu and then same thing if you're going in any of the other combat levels it's going to be about the same thing if let's say I open the chicken hunt level right here I'm going to start in a combat I can move my units around I can try to attack the enemies if I want to I can end my turns a few times and then end the combat whenever I'm bored or if the combat is over obviously and then same thing for the slow slimy level I'm going to move inside that level which starts in a combat that one is on the triangle grid which is a little bit annoying so it can be fun to play I guess uh, I don't know but if you want to try it you can and then if you're bored you can just end the combat once again and then same thing for all the other ones so let's say flying is cheating that one is on an hexagon grid uh, which is a little bit nicer than a triangle that's for sure uh, I can end my turn I can use all my units to attack the uh, little bats here and there I can move my warrior closer attack the bat and then I can end my turn and now the bats are going to play if you want to speed it up you can speed it up and now the units are going to play a little bit faster just like that and when you're bored you can just go back in the end combat which brings us to the main menu and now we're going to try something else we're going to try the overworlds and this scenario you can move your units around and trigger the encounters manually so let's trigger the square overworld and now here it is we are in the square overworld I have my units right here in the bottom left corner I can select them with the left click so I can select any of those units I actually have three teams of units so I have my first team right here which only has a warrior this one that has has two units and this one has three units if I select any of those units I can just move it on the ground with the right click afterwards so I can move this one right here move this one right there move this one oh, come here move this one right here over here it doesn't really matter I'm just moving around in the overworld but once I want to start a combat so I decided that I'm let's say I'm going to select this team right here and I'm going to attack the little slime that is alone right here I'm going to right click on the slime they are going to attack the slime and start a combat and now I can just move closer I can let's say play my combat so why not just heal myself whatever doesn't matter I'm going to attack the slime a few times here we go run away use my warrior to attack the slime once again here we go hit the slime hit the slime the slime going to play its turn two 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 now it's a turn 
of my priest. I can just move closer, kill the slime, and now the team 01, which is my team, I can end the combat and I'm brought back inside the overworld. Now I can start again moving my units around and trigger any other combats if I want to. If I'm bored, I can always end my combat uh, before the end of it, and then I can go back to the main menu to go back in the main menu, obviously. You can do the same thing with the other overworld. So in the uh, triangle overworld, is the same thing. You can just move around, trigger a combat if you want to. Here we go. Once the combat is over on or when you're bored, you can go back in the overworld and go back in the main menu. And that's it. That's it for the overworld's level. It's pretty similar to the combat one, but you can trigger the combats you want to trigger. And the last thing we have to look at is the debug map, but that one is really awesome. So let's open it. Here you can see that the level is pretty similar, but this time we have a lot of tabs at the top and all these tabs contain a bunch of debug settings that you can use to test all the features of the game and we're gonna go through all of them. So the first tab is the comment tab. This one is pretty straightforward, it just executes console comments. So you can uh, execute them if you click on the buttons and also if you uh, want to execute a console command that is not part of the buttons right here, you can just type it at the top. But that's not really important, it's just a simple debug menu that lets you execute a console command easily. So that one is done. Now we're going to go to the camera tab. This one is a little bit more interesting. So first we have all the camera controls at the top right here. So W, A, S, D, Q, and E, and the scroll wheel, obviously. And then you have all the different settings that lets you adjust the camera speed, for example. So woo, my camera can go super fast or super slowly. Same thing for the rotation speed. I can rotate super fast or even super slowly if I want to by small increments and then same thing for the zoom so i can zoom slowly faster and i can go super far if i want to but yeah that's a bit too far so that's not really great so yeah you can adjust the camera play well play around with the settings and once you're happy with some settings you can just copy them from there and paste them directly inside the pawn so they are used by default in your game okay so that was pretty straightforward too so close the camera and now we're jumping into the grid at the top we have a few actions, but since we don't have a grid generated yet, we're gonna come back with them a little bit later. For now, we're just gonna go directly to the environment right here. Right here you can select if you want to have an hexagon map, a triangle map, or even a nothing map. So nothing, if you want to generate your grid from scratch, you can do it right here, or you can generate it on top of the square map. Uh, we also have the tactical mode that hides all the art of the game and displays the tactical grid. Uh, right now we don't have a grid, so it doesn't display anything. So why not generate a grid first? So here in the grid generation, you can select if you want to have a square grid, hexagon grid, or triangle. So let's say a square grid because I'm on the square level. And now if I recheck my tactical mode, the checkbox you can see that it toggles between the level and the tactical grid. Then back in the grid generation you can decide to generate any type of grid it doesn't have to match with the environment it's just going to look a little bit weird because it doesn't really fit it's not made to work that way yeah I didn't build my level my square level to match with a triangle grid obviously so you should probably make sure that your level matches the shape of your grid, obviously, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. And even if your level matches the shape of the grid, make sure that the size and all the settings of the grid matches your level also. Because right here I have my tile size, so by default it's 200 by 200, which matches with my levels. But let's say I'm making them 400 by 400, now they don't match anymore because they are not made to work with that kind of level. So yeah. You have to make sure that your grid matches your level, otherwise it will not work the way it should. Actually, it's gonna work, it's just gonna look a little bit weird. But now we skipped a few settings, so let's go back a little bit. First, the region delay is just the delay at which we are generating the grid when we are playing with the sliders. Otherwise, it will be a little bit too performance intensive to regenerate the grid every frame. So that's why right here I'm setting a small delay. It's not really visible, but at least it improves the performance by a lot. So that's why I have a region delay right here. Then we have the Location, which is the position of the center of the grid so you can place it anywhere you want in your level so if you have a huge level you can just spawn a little grid all the way over there or over here so that's why you can adjust the center of the grid then you have the tile count which is the amount of tiles you want in your grid you can make it super small or super big if you want to if it's too big it's gonna be too expensive in performances so I don't recommend going too too big but you can go like uh, 50 by 50 or 100 by 100 it's still manageable then we have the tile size that we already talked about a little bit and then we have a little offset uh, from the ground so 
uh, if I zoom on my grid a little bit, we can see that the grid is not exactly at the same level as the ground. Otherwise, it will be flickering like that. Yeah, that's not good. So that's why I'm adding a little bit of an offset between the ground and the grid. So you can remove that flickering and also you can make sure that the grid is always visible uh, even if you have things on the ground. So let's say grass, for example. So I have a small offset between the ground and the grid and the grid is always visible. So that's pretty good. And finally, we have that magical checkbox right here that lets you generate a grid based on the environment or not. If it is based on the environment, the grid is going to align itself with the ground. The height of the grid is going to be based on the ground. Otherwise, it can be anywhere. So I can move my grid up or down and it's not dependent on the environment at all. Actually, I could even hide my level and I still have my grid right here. Or I can show any type of levels and I still have my grid uh, because it's not depending on the environment anymore. But I'd say that in most cases, you're probably going to generate the grid based on the environment because it makes more sense. So now I can generate my hexagon grid based on the hexagon environment and it matches properly. Even if I make it bigger or smaller, same way as for the grid, I can move it around, just generate a small grid in the bottom right corner, for example. Here we go. I have a small grid right here and we can do the same thing for the triangle. So if I show my triangle level, now I can display a triangle grid on top of the triangle level and it matches the world perfectly. Way better than when I was just generating it on top of the square level, obviously. So now we have all the different level and all the different grid shapes, just like that. And finally, we have a few debug options right here in the bottom left corner that lets you visualize a few things. So you have the borders of the grid, the grid center, the bottom left corner of the grid, the tiles that you are overing, and the position of the mouse in the wall. So yeah, you can uh, use those to debug your grid a little bit better. So yeah just make it a little bit smaller because right now my grid is super big way too big compared to the world so yeah now you can adjust the grid properly because you know what are the bounds of the grid just like that perfect and now I'm just going to hide all those debugs because we don't need them anymore. And we're going to take a look at the actions. All my tabs have some actions at the top right here. Actions, actions, and actions. All these actions are going to modify the behaviors of your left mouse and right mouse buttons. So let's say I select the first action, which is select tile and unit. If I do a left click on the grid, it's going to select a tile. And if there was a unit on the grid, it's going to select also that unit. But right now I don't have any units, so I'm just selecting a tile. If I do a left click on top of a selected tile, it's just going to deselect it, just like that. That one was simple. Then we have the add remove tile that was a little bit more complex. If I do a left click in the empty space, it's going to add new tiles. Here we go. I'm adding tiles on my grid. And if I do a right click, well, it removes the tile. Woohoo! So now my left click adds some tiles and the right click removes the tile. Woohoo! So I can edit my grid how I want. And those edits can also be done in combat. So if you have spells that add some tiles on your grid or remove tiles, you can use them in combat to affect the grid. And that's pretty nice. Then we have an action that increase and decrease the tile height. So the height of the tiles, if I left click on the tiles, it's going to increase the tile height. And if I right click it, they are going down, but it's not really visible that way. So I'm just going to enable the tactical mode for a second. And yeah, now you can see that the tiles are going up if I hold the left mouse button and they are going down if I hold the right mouse button. Here we go. Okay, it's a little bit confusing, so I'm just going to regenerate my grid. Okay, just like that. And now we have the set tile type action. That one affects the type of our tile. So right here, we can see that we have different colors on the tactical grid, and they are corresponding to the different tile types. So we have in red the obstacles, so the tiles that are blocking the units completely. In dark gray right here, we have the tiles that are costing three movement points to go on. These ones cost two movement points. Uh, all the gray normal ones are costing one movement point because they are normal tiles and all the pink ones are only accessible by flying units and the reason they are like that it's because in my world right here I have holes in my grid and only the flying units can walk on top of the holes obviously and when we have this action selected we can uh, edit the tile type of our tile so let's say I can override all those tiles to tell my units that they can walk on these even though they are holes and the units should not be able to walk on them but I can override that and decide that yeah my unit can fly why not I can add a bunch of obstacles if I want to. I can do the same thing with the double cost tile. Here we go. These are more expensive. Triple cost. And I can re-add some flying units only if I want to. I can make everything flying units only. It doesn't really matter.
matter. Here we go. So these are all the actions that are available in the grid tab. Now I'm just going to regenerate my grid as default just because it's a little bit nicer. And now we're going to go take a look at the pathfinding. In this tab, you'll be able to test the pathfinding of the game. So we have a bunch of actions right here and we have a few debug parameters at the bottom. We're not going to take a look at them first. We're going to start with the actions this time. First action is same as the previous tab. We can select a tile and a unit on the grid. It doesn't really matter right now. The second action is showing the tile neighbors of each of our tiles so if i click on this one this one this one it's showing all the available neighbors of those tiles obviously the tiles that are outside of the grid and not that are obstacles are not available because the unit cannot walk on them we can also decide to include the diagonals to show the neighbors of these tiles if we are including the diagonals so just like that and these neighbors are going to be different depending on the shape of the grid so if you have an hexagon grid the neighbors are going to look like this and if you have a triangle grid the neighbors are going to look something similar to that it's a bit weird but that's how it is i'm gonna go back in square because it's a little bit simpler for explanation here we go so this is the function that tells you which are the neighbors of our tile these neighbors are used in the pathfinding so it's helpful to debug the behavior of the pathfinding if there's something weird happening then we have a function that calculates the minimum cost of the tiles reaching a target so that was just really to debug the pathfinding also so let's say i click on this tile right here and it's going to calculate all the minimum cost from all the tiles on the grid to that tile so we're gonna know how much movement point is going to cost if for example you try to start from here and go all the way to this tile right here and you can decide if you want to include the diagonals or not in the calculation but uh yeah you don't see anything and that's just because i didn't enable one of my debug text and it is the one that shows the minimum cost to target right here and now we can see that the minimum cost to target was calculated and it's displayed on all the different tiles I click on this one right here or this one right here we can see that to reach this tile it costs a zero movement point because i'm already on this one to reach that same tile it costs one movement point if you're all the round right here two movement point right there etc 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 and if you don't include the diagonals obviously it's going to affect the result because right now i cannot go in diagonal to this tile right here so it's going to cost one movement point two movement point to reach that tile so yeah, that's just another debug action that you don't really use in the game. It's really just to debug the pathfinding. These other ones are a little bit more interesting though. This one, it selects thing a tile with the left click and then finding a path with the right click. So if I left click on this tile right here, it's going to display all the reachable tiles based on the setting that you write right here. So I don't want to include the diagonals. I don't want to include the flying only. And I want a length of a maximum 10 movement points. So we can see how it would look if you had the units that had those requirements. And you can adjust the length of the path, obviously, just like that. And you can include the flying unit only tiles, which are the holes on the grid. And you can include the diagonal, which also affect the result of the reachable tiles. And then and if you right click obviously it generates a path to those reachable tiles if you right click outside of the reachable tiles well it doesn't generate anything because you cannot reach those tiles and then we have two last settings which are the delay and the maximum milliseconds and those two settings are really just to improve the performances of your game because if you're calculating a huge pathfinding let's say a really 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 big one more than just a 20 movement point of length it might take a few seconds to calculate and you don't want to freeze your game for a few seconds so that's why right here i'm adding a small delay between the iteration of the pathfinding it takes more time to do the calculation as you can see right here it takes more time to generate all the reachable of my grid i don't even know okay it, it ended so that's good i didn't even know how long it will take but yeah i have a small delay in between each iteration of the pathfinding so it takes more time to calculate but it doesn't freeze your game during that calculation so that's just to improve the performances a little bit and so you don't create random lag spike when you generate a huge pathfinding but you don't always want to have a delay in between each iteration of your pathfinding that will take so long let's say if the delay is 0.10 seconds it's going to take forever to calculate so that's not good enough that's why i'm adding a maximum milliseconds which is the maximum amount of time you want to allow the pathfinding per frame so 
Let's say I want to allow five milliseconds per frame. And once I reach that maximum, it's going to wait a small delay before the next iteration. So let's say I try to calculate the reachables right here. We can see that it, it was not instant, but at least it was faster than if I were to wait 0.10 seconds every iteration of the pathfinding. So yeah, that's really just to manage your performances. So if you have a bigger budget for your pathfinding, you can increase the maximum milliseconds per iteration, and that's going to increase the speed of the pathfinding. And if really your pathfinding doesn't impact the performance, performances of the game, well, you can simply remove uh, those two variables and the pathfinding is going to be instant every time. Then the next action lets you add or remove a unit from the grid. So right here, I can add a few units here and there. I'm going to add units, adding units, adding units. Why not? I'm having fun. I'm adding units. Uh, you don't have to think about the team and the use AI variables right here. They are mainly used during combat. Right now, we are only talking about pathfinding, so they don't really matter. And now for the last action we have at the bottom, oh yeah, if I do a right click, I'm removing the units uh, because that's the slash remove unit part of the action. And then we have the select and move unit. So if I click on a unit, it shows the movement range of that unit, and that's really specific to the unit. So if I select a unit that has more movement point, uh, you can see that you can move it uh, even further on the grid. And same thing, if you right click, now it's going to move the unit on the grid. And since I'm selecting a bat right now, I can move on top of the different poles that are in my grid, but I cannot do the same thing with my warrior because he cannot fly. And now if I select my chicken, I can move all the way over the place because the chicken has so many movement points. So yeah, you can select all the different units and move them around with this action. So left click to select, right click to move around. And then you have one small variable right here, the move duration. So you can increase the time it takes for the unit to reach each tile of the path and that's taking forever. So yeah, you probably don't want to play with that variable too much, but I think it was fun. So if you want to have like a super fast unit, shoo, 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 you can do it. But yeah, you probably want to keep it somewhere like here. I don't know, something like that doesn't really matter. And finally, in this tab, you have all the different debug information. So if I check all those checkbox right here, choo, 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 it's going to display a bunch of text on my tiles. So I have like the index of my tiles, the tile type of the tiles. I have the minimum cost to enter the tile, the, the cost that cost to enter the tile, the cost from the start and the sorting index because I'm sorting all the different tiles in the path mining. That's just how it works. And if I generate a new path, you can see that the pink tiles are the tiles that were calculated during the pathfinding so it's not going to calculate everything only the tiles that it needs and i try to make it as efficient as possible so yeah these are all displaying a bunch of different information that you're probably not gonna need unless the pathfinding is broken for some random reason i hope it's not gonna happen because i'm probably going to have to fix it if it happens and i don't want to do that anyway so yeah this is the, the pathfinding tab and now i'm just going to remove all my units so it's clean for the next tab and now it's time for the spells. And this one is pretty straightforward. First action is just to select a tile. We don't really care about it. And then we have an action that selects a tile and that lets you with the right click cast the spell. So I can cast a spell right here, right here, right here. I can cast a spell as many times as I want. Here we go. So that was my debug spell. It's pretty awesome. But we also have all the real spells. So I have my sword slash right here. I have my sword right here. Like I can cast with the right click as many times as I want. Uh, this action too, I can cast this one, I can shoot a bunch of arrows all over the place, that one is even awesomer because I can catch a lot of them. I have this one that spawns a bunch of small things, so it's pretty nice too. So yeah, you can test all your different spells, and actually I shouldn't have uh, removed the unit on the grid because I'm going to re-add a few of them because it affects the spell casting. So let's say I'm going to spawn a few units right here, right here, and right here, why not? Doesn't really matter. And then in my spells, if I select a unit instead of a an empty tile, it's going to limit my spell selection to the spells that are castable by the unit. So now only those spells can be casted by the warrior and I can ask my warrior to cast the spells. Uh, so now we can see the warrior playing its casting spell animation while it's playing the spell. So that's pretty nice. And actually I can do that with all the other units. So this one right here can attack the chicken that is all the way over there. And you can see that it attacks the chicken for real. The chicken loses some health point and it's eventually going to die. But we still want to be able to test the spell. So we just respawn the units once they die. So we can continue casting spell over and over and over and test all the different spells on all the different units on the grid if we want to. And same thing, if we try to heal the units, it's gonna work also. Here we go, I can heal my priest to Oh, here we go. So that's uh, 
to test all the different spells. And finally, we have an action that lets you test all the different ranges patterns. So if, uh, let's say, I try to cast a spell from here, it's going to draw a range pattern. The range pattern by default is a line, but you can switch it to a diagonal, you can switch it to a half diagonal, a star, and all the different patterns that are available in the project right now. So here they are. You can affect the range, you can play with the range a little bit. So to test and have a preview on how it will look, if you try to design a spell with a square range, of a range three to four just like that and if you want to include the line of sight in there you can check that checkbox and now you can see that you cannot cast a spell through the obstacles that are on the grid just like that it affects the range and that's pretty nice and so let's say i have my square here that is affected by the line of sight and on top of that if you want to have the spell that is an area of effect spell you can have an area of effect range on top of it so let's say i'm going to add a star on top of my square so now if if I over one of those tiles, we can see that it displays the star of my area of effect. You can change uh, the range of the star, obviously. Okay, it kind of looks like a square now. But yeah, you can make it as big as you want or as small as you want. And you can change the range pattern also of the AOE. Uh, you can make it a line of sight required also. May, even if it's an AOE, it works also. And finally, you have some extra information that to play with and adjust the line of sight. Because right now, the line of sight is working with line traces. And they are not really perfect, in my opinion. So we can draw the line traces that are shut from the middle of the spell, just like that. And you can see that they are colliding with some obstacles. But you can affect the offset from the center of the tile to affect the result you can see that it affected the range of the spell a little bit and you can play with those values to find the best values for your project and yeah it's a little bit uh, confusing with all the debug lines but yeah you, if you play around with it it's going to be a little bit less confusing i think than if i just play around with the values like that then yeah it's better if you do it yourself and find values that are perfect for your project uh, Okay, good. So that was for the spell tab. Now it's time for the combat tab and I'm actually going to reset everything. Okay, so I just recentered my camera and removed all the units from the grid and now we're going to take a look at the combat actions. The first one is pretty simple. It's just the tile selection. We can ignore it. Then we have the action to add and remove units from the grid. It's the same as the previous one, but this time the team index is going to be important because we're going to start a combat using those team indexes. The same thing for the use AI that's going to determine which units are going to be controlled by uh, AI during the combat. So I'm just going to, let's say, add two warriors in my team zero. Here we go. I have two warriors in my team zero. Now I'm going to take the ranger and create myself a new team. So the team one, and I'm going to add one ranger in it. Why not? And then I can add the priest. Uh, why not? So I have a blue team and a red team. The red team contains two units that are different. And then you can add AIs on the grid. So let's say I'm going to add a few AIs that are slimes right here. And then in the same thing, I can add a chicken. And finally, I can add a few bats here and there. Here we go. So I have a bunch of units on the grid and they are ready to start a combat. They are all in different teams. And in this project, you can have as many teams as you want. Right now I have four teams on the grid, but you can add as many teams as you want. But I think it gets a bit confusing if you have too many teams. Anyway. The next combat action is just to set the unit team index. So if you made a mistake and you want to change the team index of a unit, so let's say I want my ranger and my priest to go back with my warriors. Here we go. Now they are back in the team zero. But if I want them back in the team red, I can do that just like this. Here we go. It's just a left click just to change the team index. And then under this, you can see the teams that are currently in the game. So I have my team zero, my team two, and my team three, and they are ready to start a combat. Uh, we're going to take a look at the unit AI once the combat is started, but that's just going to display the current state of the AI and what they are thinking and executing. And then finally, we have the combat category right here at the bottom that lets us start the combat. But we have to make sure that the requirements are met first, otherwise we cannot start a combat. Let's say if you don't have two or more units on the grid, it's just going to be one unit and you can't really fight anything if you're alone. And same thing, if you only have one team, you need at least two teams to be able to fight. Otherwise, you're just going to fight your own team and that's not good either. Anyway, so let's start a combat, and now we are in combat like usual. I can move my unit around, I can cast some spell if I want to, I can end my turn, same as usual. But now I have some AIs right here, and if I click and turn, the AI are going to play their turn. And in the unit AI category right here, you can see their thinking process and all the actions they are executing from the beginning of their turn all the way to the end. So you can analyze it and see if it works or not, and it helps really to find out if the AI bugs somewhere, you can see 
see uh, where they are stuck and then you can go back in the AI and see what's happening. So uh, you can also increase the delay in between each of those states. So the AI is just going to wait a little bit before uh, going to the next state. That's just to help us uh, debug it a little bit better. So you have time to uh, really take a look at what is happening and what are the decisions of the AI. But if you want the AI to execute everything super fast, you can just remove the delay and now the AI are just going to execute all the steps uh, step by step super fast as soon as they are ready to do that. Here we go. So this is the combat tab. I can end my combat whenever I want. Here we go. Now I'm back to normal and all the units are back on the grid to where they were before the beginning of the combat. So everybody's respawn, everybody's placed to the right position and they are ready to start a new combat. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go inside the overall tab. So first I'm just going to remove all my units. And I'm also going to destroy the grid because the grid is not important in the overworld. So let's go in the grid, destroy the grid, and then we can go in the overworld tab. And in this one, it's pretty straightforward. You can simply add units in the overworld. So here you can add and remove units from the overworld. Here we go, here we go. You can change the group ID. The group ID is different from the team ID that you were using in the combat tab. That group ID is just going to be used in the overworld because not all the units that are in the overworld are going to be in the combat. So you can have as many groups as you want in the overworld but it doesn't mean that they are going to be all fighting at the same time so right now let's say for example i have a group that is right here those two units right here in the top left corner then i have a group for all those bats i have a smaller group here a chicken and a slime a group here here and here so i have a few groups in my overworld but if i start a combat it's not going to take all those units and put them inside the combat it's just going to trigger the combat using the units i want to and to trigger a combat well we have to control some units and attack other units Units. And the way I did that is that some groups are encounters on the grid. They are predefined as encounters. So the player can attack them. And let's say I'm going to set a group as an encounter. So let's say this one right here with a left click, this one with a left click, this one with a left click. And you can see that they are starting to move all around the grid for fun. Uh, at any time, you can just cancel this with a right click. So these groups are not going to be encounters anymore. But in my case, I'd like to have all of them be encounters so I can move around and attack them if I want to. So all those groups now are going to be encounters they are moving around on the grid by themselves and now what i can do is select and move my units in the overworld the only units i can select are the ones that are not encounters the one that i can control so this one right here at the top we can see that i can select those units right here here we go and i can decide to use them to attack any of the other groups so i can right click on the grid to move around and once i'm done walking around for fun i can just decide to attack one of the group and the units are just going to reach the group location and start an encounter now i can play the combat so move my units around a little bit i can cast some spells of course i cannot target them because they are too far they are going to play their turn and everything i can end the combat if i want to but if i'm just too lazy i can just end the combat manually and now i'm brought back in the overworld so yeah i can just do it one more time i can just select my units move around attack another group it's going to attack the group and now i can just simply play the combat as usual and when i'm done i can always go back in the overworld so yeah this level really lets you test all the features of the game in their own little environment so you can easily go through all the tabs and test all the different features without having to build a real level and recreate a specific scenario in the game so perfect okay we're done with this map so i can go back in the main menu and that's actually pretty much everything i wanted to show you in today's video i know we didn't look at the project at all but we're going to do that in the next video where I'm going to explain all the different mechanics of the project and how they interact with each other. But that's going to be it for today. So I'm going to see you in the next one. Bye bye.